Hi, I'm Alan Smith. You know, we just cannot deny the importance of plants, certainly as food, but also as medicine. If you look at records going back 5,000 years, plants served a very important role as herbal cures. Of course, back then, that's all they had. Take this basil, for instance. Not only is it beautiful, but it's long been known for its anti-inflammatory and antioxidant properties. In fact, millions of dollars have recently been invested into the benefits of these herbs. Researchers are beginning to steer away from conventional drug development and look toward more alternative and natural forms of treatments. Our first guest on the show is known as the hedonistic herbalist, Susan Belsinger. Susan delights in kitchen alchemy, blending herbs and spices to create real, delicious food that nourishes our bodies and titillates the senses. Susan is a flavor artist. She's an herbalist. She's a hedonistic herbalist. <laughs> so Susan, what is a hedonistic herbalist? The definition of it is seeking pleasure yeah. or devotion to pleasure. Pleasure so, seeking, yeah. Yeah, so when I say, uh, you know, hedonistic herbalism, people go, you know, like, mm, yeah. you know, what about that? But it's just seeking pleasure. And the second definition is often through your senses. So it doesn't, it, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. <laughs> it's a fun name. Yeah. So what is it about herbs that put you in that category? I think it's so important that we smell and sure. taste them because it elevates the way that we eat and cook food. There are five tastes, but in your olfactory memory and mine, they say that there's about 70,000 to 100,000 smell memories. So basically, smell is approximately 90% of taste. Mm. Smell plus taste equal flavor. This, I like this kind of math. Yeah. Because <laughs> <laughs> it leads to food. Here we have some cilantro, yep. um, which is the leaf and flower of the coriander seed. And the people flowers, have strong opinions about this Yes, herb. some people <clears throat> love it or hate it. What do you get mm. when you smell? Bitter. A little pungent, mm -hmm. a little stinky, mm -hmm. okay? And then when you taste it, you get all of that. <laughs> yeah, you do. You get pungent, really green herby, mm -hmm. bitter. But I like a little bitterness for contrast in my food, so. So bitter is really good for us, mm -hmm. and it's an underused taste mm -hmm. in the United States especially. We, we love salt, we love sugar, <laughs> you know, we love sweet. In fact. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well that's, that's what makes everything reason. taste good. Bitter helps us to taste better. It's really great for our digestion. Mm. So when you taste something bitter, you salivate immediately. Enhancing the digestive process. Yeah, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. This is really cool stuff. So we gather some of the sage, what do you think of that, Susan? Well, this is one of my favorite sages. This is Bert Garden, and it's a salvia officinalis. This has uh, been used for centuries in cooking meats and stews and mm -hmm. things like that. Mm -hmm. And they didn't know it back then. They didn't even know the word. But this is such a great antioxidant mm. to put with fatty meats and stews that mm. it helps you to digest Okay, them. sure. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you mm -hmm. associate it with the Thanksgiving turkey. Exactly. Right, I love it on pork. And it helps you to digest all that gravy, yeah. that fatty gravy. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so when you taste this, just do a little taste. It's really pungent. And I, I use it in, in the fall, seasonally. I really love it with apples and pears. I make mm -hmm. applesauce with mm -hmm. it. And, and of course, Susan, you, you talk a lot about seasonality in your latest book. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. I really um, eat herbs and vegetables in season and fruits. And yeah. When things are in season together, then you always get a good flavor combination. Even if it's a vegetable and a fruit and an herb, you yeah. can make it taste good. They sing on your palate. They do. Yeah. So for someone in their kitchen or growing herbs for the first time, the real takeaway here, Susan, is is what? Taste, smell and taste first? Smell and taste. And if you like it, then go for it. You right. know, if you don't like it, then go on to your next herb. Set it aside. Why waste your time? Right. Yeah. Yeah. And then experiment with that in the foods that you like. Right. Yeah. And the more you think about smelling and tasting, the more you develop your sense of mm -hmm. taste. It's really your own personal genetic makeup. And totally. so you can't be wrong. It's just 
what you like. No, it's all about smell, taste, and yeah. flavor. And yeah. that's what that's what's gonna make you happy and that's what you should do. Yeah. You know. Follow your nose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Still to come on Garden Style, we step into the lab of an alchemist. Plus, we explore the world of natural herbal tinctures, so stay tuned. Just look at all these beautiful garlic chives. This is one of the easiest herbs we grow here at the farm. I just love it, and the fragrance, well, I wish you could smell this. If you love garlic, you'd love these garlic chives. You know, alchemy goes way back. I think the origin of alchemy was taking something ordinary, like an ordinary metal, and this idea of turning it into gold really captured people's imagination. But there's also an alchemy of food, where you take ordinary things and turn them into extraordinary flavors. Our friends at Pink House Alchemy have been working on some of this magic for the past 10 years, making syrups and bitters with some extraordinary flavors. The company began in a 113-year-old pink house in Fayetteville, Arkansas. Uh, I was in school for dietetics and biology, and I was studying food science, and I was also working in the food industry. And so pink house, pH alchemy, with the science background, like it just worked out, and the alchemists, academics of food and beverage and drinks, and that's kind of how it was born. Our primary, our largest seller is a syrup. This is our vanilla syrup, um, an understated product for sure, but one of our most popular. Super rich mouthfeel. You can actually see all the vanilla bean in the bottom of the cup. It's just delicious. And then a little bit of cream, and that's, that's, that's it. It's very simple, delicious, it's a treat. Everything we use is raw and uh, whole botanicals, whole spices, no extracts, anything like that. So that's the syrups, and then we make shrubs, which is a sipping vinegar, and you can use it in cocktails, or it's just a delicious, it's a digestif, it's good for your intestines and your gut flora, so it's healthy and yummy. And, and uh, bitters, um, it's just an extract of roots and barks and different botanicals, and they are extracted with a little, with alcohol. We're gonna start with our spicy cardamom syrup. So the two banana daiquiri is a love story cocktail, um, and it's because it takes two bananas, so rich and creamy, and it complements the spice of the cardamom really well. And I'm just adding, as is traditional with um, in a daiquiri, one lime, and then of course rum. It would not be a daiquiri without good amounts of rum. And then we blend it up. Delicious. And that's it, that's the two banana daiquiri. This time of year, typically, we would have had some berry drinks. Our region was flooded so severely this year that the berry farmers um, in three states really suffered a, an intense loss. And so we produced an herb syrup. This is our Herbalicious syrup. Uh, it's made with raspberry, mint, lavender, and thyme. So it takes one and a half ounces of syrup. We're gonna cut about a half of an inch to an inch of cucumber off. One and three quarters ounces to two ounces, again, of gin. One whole lemon. Quick shake. I'm gonna top with just a tiny bit of regular soda water. That's our Herbalicious cooler. We're chefs and scientists, so we, I believe in the benefits and the healing abilities of all food that's manufactured with thought and, and uh, intention. And I think that our product, um, that's 100% what it is. Have you always wanted to start your own apothecary planter? After the break, I'll show you how. Today, when we look for a cure, we go to the drugstore, but in the past, it was the apothecary. So why don't we step back in time and create our own apothecary planter? It's really easy, but to do it, you wanna start first with the right container. 
If you're reusing a plastic container, you'll want to make sure it's food grade plastic. You see, you want to avoid harmful chemicals leaching into your soil. If you're not sure, you may want to find another type of container. The next thing you'll want to do is choose your herbs. Today, I've chosen Italian flat leaf parsley, lemon thyme, and rosemary. I picked this combination because all three of these plants need partial to full sunlight, and all three hold a high medicinal and culinary value. Let's start with the rosemary. For 2,000 years, it's been used as a stress reliever, a great herb for your skin, as well as a memory booster. Now let's move over to the thyme. Thyme's been used for a long, long time, and it's purported to have qualities that help you with bronchitis, blood clots, and even used as a mouthwash. Having your plants in a lightweight planter allows you to move them easily. You can rearrange the patio, you can move them into better light, and you can also move them inside during winter months. So what's the takeaway here? Well, I think it's integrating herbs into your containers. They're not only beautiful, but very useful. Get creative and enjoy the countless benefits they can bring to us. After the break, we explore the world of natural herbal tinctures, so stay tuned. Don't you just love rosemary? I love growing it, I love smelling it, and I love using it in the kitchen. Rosemary is one of those herbs that has, well, as many antioxidants, as many vegetables and fruits. Our next guest herbal tinctures make it easy for you to enjoy the benefits of fresh herbs while preserving the potency of your herbal harvest. An apothecary is your sort of herbal medicine closet. So your cough syrups, your tinctures, your salves and ointments that you might use. Anybody can make these tinctures, they're surprisingly easy. Today we'll be making a tincture from a beautiful plant called Tulsi also called holy basil. It's a very beautiful aromatic herb that's good for digestion and calming your nerves. It's an adaptogen which helps you to really um, handle the stress that you might be dealing with in your day. It has many different beneficial purposes. When you're making a tincture, you can either cut it or you can crush it a little bit to fit into your jar. And then we're gonna do it as a light pack on the jar. I'm gonna be using vodka to make this tincture. You don't need to buy fine vodka for this either. Your basic inexpensive vodka should do just fine. And I'm filling the jar just above where the herb is. I'm gonna take a spoon and I'm just gonna poke it down and make sure I don't have any air bubbles in there. This will sit on my windowsill or somewhere in my home where I will see it every day for about four to six weeks. The first week or two, I'm gonna to wanna to come in every day and agitate it. I'm gonna check it, I'm gonna shake it around, make sure the vodka is touching all of the herb. And if, it's, if I need to, I can top it off with a little more vodka. And it looks like maybe I do here. They all look very similar when the leaves turn brown and the liquid becomes dark. So I always make sure to label it. Now if I were using, tincturing a dry herb, I would do the same process, only I would fill my jar only about a third to a half full. So we're gonna strain this, this tincture. It's been sitting on my windowsill for about six weeks and it's ready to be strained. The leaves are spent and the tincture is, has extracted all the medicinal properties out of the herb. The good thing about using cheesecloth is that allows you to bring it, all the edges back up together and it can be wrung out so you don't miss a drop of your valuable tincture. Speaking of valuable, when, I, when you buy a tincture in the store, you can spend upwards of $15 on an ounce of tincture and an ounce of vodka costs about 40 cents so you can see the price savings in making your own. Now this tincture is ready to be put into 
a dropper bottle so that it can be dispensed. So I have a small funnel. And I'll just fill my bottle. Typically, you just use um, a drop by dropper spool, and they have approximately 30 or 35 drops in each one, and that's about a quarter teaspoon. And often people will take it directly on their tongue. For some people, it's a little bitter, so they might add it to a little bit of water, warm water, or some juice, or another beverage to drink. So save yourself a little money and use this simple method to make your own tinctures for remedies for your family. Still to come, we talk to a garden expert about the benefits of planting in a raised bed. If you know me, you know I've been an advocate of raised beds for a long time, particularly if you're into growing herbs. Just take a look at this blue African basil. Not only does it smell great, it's beautiful to look at, and if you look closely, you'll see our honeybees are really working the flowers. So it's a great plant for the herb garden on lots of levels. For some more helpful tips on creating a raised bed, let's head over to Heifer International, where my friend Nina will share some of her helpful advice. I'm Mina Collins, and I'm one of the master gardeners from Pulaski County, and you're here at our project at Heifer International. What's really rewarding about being at Heifer International and a part of their education and demonstration garden is the fact that people are able to come and enjoy it. We have children coming through, usually on a daily basis, taking a tour of the garden. This bed is one of my favorite beds. It's the herb bed. As you can see, we're growing lavender. This is also pineapple sage. The reason I like this is because of the smell. It smells just like pineapple. It's extremely easy to grow herbs in pots. Your perennial herbs, they're very forgiving, they're very resilient, and they will come back. The principles that I live by are experiment. Experiment with different techniques. There's so many different things that you can learn online uh, as far as researching whatever you're growing. Also, step out of your comfort zone. If you're used to growing fruits, grow vegetables. Another thing I would always tell gardeners is Never give up. If it's not working, try it again. Just because it looks dead, it doesn't necessarily mean that it really is dead. And most importantly, have fun. That's the most important thing. Use it as a sense of adventure and have fun. And I think if you incorporate these principles, you will enhance your gardening experience as well as your, your skills. Want to learn more? Visit pallensmith.com for delicious recipes, garden tips, blog posts, and our online store. Every day it seems like more of us are looking for natural alternatives to conventional drugs. The idea of natural cures is growing in popularity. For over five billion people worldwide, natural plant-based approaches are used every day for treating health problems. Whether you're experimenting with tinctures, making your own syrup for your coffee, or planting your own apothecary planter, there's so many ways to enjoy the health benefits of natural medicine. So if you're looking for a remedy for what ails you, the first thing to do is check in with your healthcare professional and see if some of these natural cures might help you out. Until next time, I'm Alan Smith.